Welcome to BBS. If you have a phone, can you just put it on silent? We're about to begin the New Year together. Let's sing together. Herschel, nice to see you. Cantor nice Fox. to see you, Rabbi. It's so lovely. To, I'll be you still summer. look very young. That's the last time I'm going to say it. And you don't, so it's all good. No, I love you. We love each other. Let's sing. Let's sing. Come on. Please. This is the Negan that we're going to sing over and over and over again, okay? I want you to sing it with us. Give us a C major. Give me more than that. Come on. Very nice. Now that was really, I can't say very good, but it was better than last year. But could you just give me a little more, because we only have going to sing this 30, 35 times, so I want you to know it. Here we go. And. I, 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 I. That's very nice. That's very, very, very good. Okay. Choir sounds really, really nice. Really nice. And it's good to have Chris Harden back with us. So it's so nice to see you, Chris. Thank you for coming back. We're going to begin our service with lighting the candle. So I ask the congregation to please rise while Shoshana, Elaine, Judy, and Bobby are going to lead us in the blessings over the candle. La, 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 la. La, 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 la.
sit down yet. Don't sit down. By the way, if you are in the back, you can always come to the front. You can always sit. Open seating tonight. We have uh, these beautiful poetry booklets. They're a little different this year. Um, can you take them out? Because if you take a look, there's one poem for every service because the high holidays are indeed a journey. And I thought maybe we'd open with the Arab Rosh Hashanah poem of reading. We can read together. It's called Reconnect. So if you'd like to read that with me before we do Baruch Hu, really appreciate it. Join with me if you can. Once more we meet in the twilight of the year. Once more time has flowed into the ocean of existence, leaving a hushed silence on this eve of the new year. Once more the gates open outward toward the undiscovered. Everything is possible. Once more the gates open inward, connecting to our heart center. We are open. Once more our hands open to clasp another, feeling the presence of our loved one. We reconnect from different homes to come. To this house of prayer we arrive. Let us join together in joy and love as the gates swing open. Let us begin. Page 18, Call to Worship, Baruch.
Shema Yisrael are on page 22. Shema Yisrael
Pero o Peru Salenho Sucar Shlomecha Baruch Adonai Baruch We rise together on page 33 for Tiku Bechodesh in Tukadesh. Tiku Bechodesh in Tukadesh. Page 34. <laughs> now. It's the first of many opportunities for private meditation and reflection. Take a minute to think about the year that was, the year that is to be, those who are with us and those who are not. The words of the private, the silent Amida begin on page 36. At the conclusion of your prayers and meditations, you may be seated.
continue with Kaddish Shalem on page 50. Fox, huh? Exuberant. I love you, Herschel. We're not doing Kiddush yet, though. Oh, we're not. No. I mean, we could. I could skip this sermon. We could go home if you want. For a minute. Okay. You can close your books for a minute. In prepping for this year's sermon, I put a post out on Facebook asking anyone who wanted to, to post the words to a love song that uh, came to mind. I got over 200 responses. So I thought I'd start this evening, uh, if you would indulge me, uh, to play a little game with you. I'm going to sing the beginning of the song, and if you can join me and try to keep up with me, maybe we'll do this together, okay? You help me see what you, can, what you know and what you don't know, okay, and what I know and what I don't. So, and I'm not the best singer, so just let's, let's just get through this together. Love, love me do, you know I love you, I'll always be true, so please, love me. Okay, so you got that one, that's nice. We're not going to sing the whole song, Chris, I'm going to carry it. All right, how about this one? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing we can give. Love. Okay, that's good. How about this one? This is for younger people. One love, one love. Let's get together and feed. Huh? He doesn't know that one. That's Bob Marley. That one's from my brother, who's here, by the way. Okay, how about this one? One man come in the name of love. One man come and go. One man come here to justify. One man to overthrow. In the name of One more in the name of love. Good, all right, all right, all right one more, okay? Stop in the It over. Okay, okay, okay. Good job. Yeah, thank you guys. Give yourself a round of applause. That was nice. Okay. I was going to talk about tonight and tomorrow, in fact, the rest of the holiday. It's once uh, said 
that Judaism is a tradition of minimum text and maximal interpretation. Take these three words from the book of Leviticus. Ve'ahavta, Arecha, Kamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. How clear can this be? How straightforward, how simple, and how universal. Ve'ahavta, Arecha, Kamocha. Three words, love, neighbor, as yourself. This year, I'm going to give two sermons on a single same verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. On Rosh Hashanah, I'd like to explore the first two-thirds of the verse, V'ahavta l're'echa, or love your neighbor. And then Yom Kippur, we're going to explore what that last word really means, kamocha, yourself. Now, it's also been said by many in history that Judaism is not a religion that ennobles love. That love your neighbor as yourself is a small thing. An exception to the regular rule of the God of the Bible. After all, the Torah itself never depicts God coming to the people to say, I love you. It's not written there even once. To sum this up, in modern times, the great thinker and mystic Joseph Campbell said of all things about his computer, that computers are like the God of the Old Testament. Lots of rules and no mercy. Who by Mac and who by Windows? Who by the spinning wheel and who by the blue screen of death? Who by the failure to back up and who by forgetting their password? But in all seriousness, Campbell's line of thinking is typical of two millennia of polemics against Judaism. That thinking goes that the old God of Judaism is irascible, holding grudges and requiring a heavy penance for sin. As early as the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew, the earliest gospel according to scholars, Jews are decried as a people who are too focused on ritual, on the length of our tzitzit, or what we put into our mouths, or even where we sit in shul on the holidays. Although I'm afraid Matthew probably got that last one right. Further on, in the Gospel of John, in the 13th chapter, it's written, I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so must love you must love one another. For John, Christianity was a new religion founded not on the preconditions of covenant and of law, but on the new world order, built entirely and only on the emotion of love. I'm not here today to refute the bona fides of Christianity or to dispensate against the gospel of Matthew or John. I leave them them to preach their own truth, as I do have great feelings of warmth and companionship towards Christians and brothers and sisters. As someone famously said, some of my best friends are Christians. But I am here to set forth from our own tradition what these gospels miss and what we often miss. That the commandment to love each other is not new. And just because God never said the words, I love you, does not mean that we're not worthy of God's love or felt the warmth of God's love or know how to love because of God's love. That's why we have to get this right in our time and today in a world that seems so distant from love. Judaism and Jews must take a stand to make our claim about who we are and the covenant we stand for. For right now, our world is full of hatred and xenophobia, of greed and corruption and racism and fear, and worst of all, the expectation that love is as naive and as simple emotion left to the privacy of your house and to your bedroom and not brought into this house or the big house or the boardroom. In a world that is dark and bleak and thinks too little of itself, we have to get this right. We have to show what we mean by Jewish love. And that has existed and sustained us long before the gospel. And certainly long before law was stripped of love by the modern philosophers and political thinkers. We have to speak to the idea of commanded love. Or I would say covenantal love. And why this is indeed Jewish love. And why the commandment, these three words are perhaps the most important one for us to hear today. To do that, to share our covenantal understanding of love, I think it's best to tell you a story. 
about the rabbi who loved God and loved the world more than any other in the history of our people, who lived in a world not unlike our own. Born to humble origins, Akiva ben Yosef became a shepherd and married a woman named Rachel. His life was simple. He tended the flocks and he tended his family until he turned 40. And at 40, he had a midlife crisis that changed the world forever. Many men buy sports cars or get season tickets or flirt with the wrong kind of people. Akiva did something far more radical for a shepherd. He studied Torah. He devoured text after text and soon became one of the greatest rabbis, not just of his time, but of any time. He reared thousands upon thousands of students. He led the effort to canonize the Tanakh, our Bible. His writings were so cherished by his pupil, Rabbi Meir, that he kept them safe and he expounded on his own teacher's writings. Rabbi Meir passed these precious writings onto one of his students, a man named Judah, who became Yehuda Hanasi, said to be born on the same day that Akiva died. And Yehuda Hanasi became the prince and the editor of the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva's grand student. It was Akiva's notion of Jewish law, and it was Akiva's notions of halakha. It was Rabbi Akiva's methodology for studying and expounding on the Torah that became the outline for all Jewish law, constructing the very worldview that makes us Jews one generation after the next, for thousands of years, all the way up until today. Such was the power of Rabbi Akiva's words that it said that he entered the holy orchard of Torah study and he came out stronger and saner than anyone else when others went mad and even got sick and even died. Such was the wisdom of Rabbi Akiva that even Moses, according to the legend, when looking down from heaven, was speechless at Akiva's ability. Such was his exuberance for love that he ended up giving his life for. He gave up his life for love. The world into which Rabbi Akiva lived was brutal. A people conquered, a land vanquished. Akiva saw it all. 25 years after the fall of the temple, the Jews stood watching over the smoldering ruins of Jerusalem, and Rabbi Akiva was chosen to be a regional emissary to the capital, to Rome. And he spent two years in Italy, and Akiva saw firsthand how Rome was powerful and oppressive. The Roman Caesars knew of love too, but Roman love is narcissistic. They love power and money and prestige and violence. Everything is about power in the Roman mind. Their greatest teacher, a man named Cicero, a hundred years before Rabbi Akiva in his first speech before the Roman Senate of which he took over, believed that loyalty to the state was more important than one's own convictions. Those that were the dissidents, those that thought for themselves, who didn't agree with the Senate's agenda, felt the power and brutality of the Roman legion, an expression other than, any expression other than what was Roman was treasonous. It is incumbent upon the state, as he writes and says, to call the dregs of the republic. And by that he means those who resist the oppression of Roman rule. The two years Rabbi Akiva was in Rome, a new Caesar had come to power, and he was a particularly bad man by the name of Titus, Flavius, Caesar, Domitianus, Augustus. That is a very long name. Who felt, that the on- who felt that only he had the right idea about Roman power. Domitian curtailed the power of the Senate by creating a cult of personality around his rule. He stripped Roman citizens of their citizenship and sought to undo the Republic and refashion it into an empire. Domitian took the surname Augustus in order to link his rule to the emperors of old in an effort to restore Rome's greatness, in his words, to that of the emperor under Augustus Caesar. It is into this world that Rabbi Akiva was born. It was into this world that Rabbi Akiva preached. It was into this world of oppression and suppression that he came. A world of violence and xenophobia, a world of hate, a world where the most powerful nation on earth teetered on the edge of despotism, fascism, and risking its own democratic origin all in the name of regaining greatness. It is into this world where ideas like friendship and love were snuffed out like embers. A world that found favor in the eyes of Machiavelli, 
and Nietzsche and Mussolini and Hitler and all those who believe that the rule of law comes through fear and scheming and physical coercive power. Rome ruled a world that says if you're not in the in-group, you are nothing but dregs to be thrown out like garbage, treated like animals, sent to the circus or to the Colosseum to fight for the life, for your life, or to be crucified, to be tortured, and to be humiliated. A world where your citizenship can be stripped, your rights taken away, and your life decimated because you speak out against the Republic. This, this is the world that Rabbi Akiva knew, and he was born, and the one in which he preached, and the one that eventually took his life. And yet, this void and vastness and darkness, Akiva chose to protest. He chose not to be silent. Akiva chose to study and to teach Torah in the schoolhouse and in the synagogue and in the street and in the Colosseum. And what was Rabbi Akiva's revolutionary thinking that changed the world? It's love. It's love. He looked into the darkness of the world that the Torah's greatest, and said the Torah's greatest teaching is about love. The tradition teaches that when debating what is the most important verse of the Torah, out of 5,888 verses in the five books of Moses, Akiva chose our little verse, our three little words. Love your neighbor as yourself. Zeklal gadol min ha-Torah, the greatest principle of the Torah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our three words, v'ahavta recha kamocha, this is the greatest principle. In the writings attributed to Rabbi Akiva's uh, understanding of the world, the Talmud records that love, even in the toughest and roughest of times, gives you hope for a better future. Love, according to another source, is stronger than oppression. Love, according to another source, says that when we argue with each other, we can be fierce. We can be strong. We can mean what we say, but we need not engage. We need not disengage from each other because we cannot disengage from the world. For as the Talmud teaches, the banner of our people is the banner of love. Love is stronger than political forces because it endures forever. It is love. Rabbi Akiva's primary teaching is that of love against the blackness, the oppression, the injustice, the fear, the uncertainty, the danger, he dared risk. He did, Rabbi Akiva. He says the central theme of the Torah is love. Against this background, we know that love is a challenge. Love is resistance. Love is protest. Rabbi Akiva knew the power of love. And he, and he knew what kind of strength it could give each and one, every one of us to help us adore, endure even in the bleakest of hours. It is why he sought to find love in every moment and in every place. Love, not fear, not ritual, not obligation, is at the center of our covenant with God. And at first glance, it might be hard to see that directly in our Torah. But I'll give you an example of how Rabbi Akiva saw it. When it came to adding the songs of songs to the Tanakh, a small book filled with love poetry, it was Rabbi Akiva who was its biggest advocate. Do not, Rabbi Akiva said, underestimate the value of poetry, for it is the song of love between God and the Jewish people. It is with a small candle, this songbook, this little love song, say the rabbis, that the treasure of the Torah can truly be understood, and how right they were. Using Rabbi Akiva's interpretation, the entire story of the Torah comes alive through the lens of Song of Songs, every moment renewed, revealed again as a love song between Israel and God, the moment of Sinai being the greatest. Those who lambast Judaism as a religion based on God's heartless power and commandedness look to the smoking mountain with its thunder and its lightning and the trembling mass of humanity standing under the mount as the moment God took a love away from the world, and replaced it with fear. That God freed us from one tyrant only to put us, according to some scholars, under the bondage of another. But the Song of Songs comes and teaches us in that moment. Set me as a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your hand. 
For love is fierce as death, passion mighty as Sheol. Its darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. Rabbi Akiva's student again, Rabbi Meir, saw not only this, a moment of fear and power, but a moment of love. The smoke of the mountain evaporates into a chuppah. The fire is not of heat and wrath, but of darts of passion and love. The covenant carved into the tablets was a seal not in stone, but upon the heart and upon the hand. According to the Akivan view, the Torah itself came down from the mountain and went to each individual and said, Here I am. This is me. These are the commandments. Will you have me? And each Israelite said, Yes. Then the Torah replied, according to Song of Songs, Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. And the Israelites on that day agreed to be covenanted to God and the Torah, sealed upon the heart and upon the hand. We must find love everywhere and at every moment. For our covenant, our moment with God, the moment of revelation, the moment of bonding of truth to the world is a moment of love. Unlike Caesar, who used Roman law to place his heel upon the necks of the vulnerable, Rabbi Akiva, and for us, his descendants, the covenant with God, we know is a covenant of love. Our God does not place the heel. Our God outstretches the arm to deliver the enslaved, to raise up the downtrodden, to heal, to partner, to upend the earth in love. The God of Judaism is a God of love, and the Torah is our ketubah which means that the greatest love letter, love letter ever written opens with these words. Breshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz v'aita ha-aretz haita tohu v'vohu v'ruach Elohim v'rachefet ala tohom. In the beginning, God created the world out of chaos and the spirit of God floated over the deep. And God looked into the darkness, into the chaos, into the blackness, into the void, and said, let there be light. It's the most remarkable thing ever written. It's the most remarkable choice ever made. For out of the vastness of the void, of God drew the light and chose to create a space for us, to love us and to be loved by us, to invite us under the chuppah. Out of meaninglessness, God chose meaning. Out of darkness, God chose light. Out of nothingness, God chose to make something. That is Jewish love. That is covenantal love. The Torah is a love letter to the world against the darkness and uncertainty of the meaninglessness of life. Against the stars of the universe, the wheelhouses of heaven, out of the pool of the maw of injustice, God blew life into the nostrils of humanity and said, you matter. No matter how small you feel, how insignificant your life seems, you matter. No matter how hard your life is in this moment, you matter. And the choices you make matter. In other words, God said, I love you. I love you. What more do we need? God never says, I love you directly in the Torah, but every breath is a wonder. Every moment is graceful. Existence itself, life itself, then, is an act of of love. This is what Rabbi Akiva's greatest achievement was, was helping us to shape this Jewish worldview forever. Our liturgy reflects Rabbi Akiva's revolution in thinking about Judaism and about the world. We sang a love song earlier tonight. You know it. I'll sing it. You can sing along if you want. Ahavat olam beit Yisrael amcha ahavta. I was checking to see if you're still awake. That's good. An unending cosmic love letter is given to each and every one of us. It's inscribed in the Torah and its commandments and its laws and its precepts. The covenant is a covenant of love. The mitzvot are the verses of its love song. Ki hem chayenu v'orech yamenu. They are our life and they give us life and they set our path and our days. Covenantal love is not romantic love. It is not eros. Covenantal love is not simply friendship. It is not philia. Covenantal love is not simply grace. It is not agape. There, those are words in Greek used to describe love by the philosophers. But there is no Greek word 
for Hebrew covenantal love. Because covenantal love doesn't come out of Athens or Golgotha. The Torah comes from Zion and out of Jerusalem. It is called in Hebrew chesed. Chesed is love laden with responsibility and clad in deed. Chesed is the type of love that binds kindness and caring to our sense of mutuality and our common fate. Chesed takes into account our obligations to each other's flourishing and not just our own emotional dispositions. Chesed is the kind of love that comes as a seal of covenant. For a song a song says, set me as a seal upon your heart and a seal upon your hand. There must be a covenant in order to have love. There must be the rule of law. But those laws, because they are given in love, must be flexible enough to caress the nape of human suffering. That is why sin matters. That is why Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur matter, because you must be held morally accountable for your sins. Sins against others, sins against yourself, and indeed sins against God. And yet, and yet at that moment when we lay bare our sins, we use these words, Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum Bechanun, Erech Apayim, Chesed Ve'emet. Our God is a God of compassion and grace and love. Even though we hold each other accountable and we remember each other's sin, according to the Torah, but in doing so, we do so in love. For there is no prophet to intercede for you. There is no priest to make expiation for you. We must all be held accountable to save ourselves. And we can do that because we know that God is a God of love. But then how do we return God's love? Our Torah, of course, has the answer. We read it earlier tonight. You know it. I know it. I'll start singing. Sing along with me if you can. Still awake, that's good. Love God with all your might, with all your heart, and with all your soul. Bind these words as a front lip between your eyes and a sign upon your hand. Or in other words, set me as a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your hand. Loving God back, then, is a full body experience. God gave us love through the word, and we return it through the deed. To love God is to act, then, on God's behalf. The Hasidic tradition teaches that love your neighbor as yourself. The word kamocha carries the same numerical value, the gematria value of 86, which is the same numerical value of the word Elohim. To love your neighbor is to love God. This is not an academic discussion. The repercussions are real. It is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of community and nationhood of ethics and our mutual responsibility for each other. To love God, then, is to love the covenant. To love God is to love your neighbor. To love God is to love the world. It only says twice in the Torah to love God. But it says 36 times to love the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. You cannot love God without loving the world. You cannot love God who loves the orphan, the widow, and the stranger without loving the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. For each of them is your neighbor. You cannot love God and support policies that that make orphans in the world. You cannot love God and support policies that kill innocent people and make widows and widowers in the world. You cannot love God and cast out the stranger, the poor, the downtrodden, because the covenant with God is that of love and with law at its center, then Jewish justice is Jewish love. And Jewish love is justice. Justice is love. And love is justice. Just as God chose to pull the light out of the darkness, Akiva, Rabbi Akiva chose to resist the very oppressive dark of the world that surrounded him. Love is how Rabbi Akiva resisted oppression. Love is how we resist oppression. Love is how we resist hate. Love is how we say against the void and the darkness, we say, let there be light. 
let there be love. When you see an act of hate, act with love. Let there be love. When you see an act of injustice, act with love. Let there be love. When you see an act of oppression, act with love. Let there be love. We cannot fight for justice by returning anger for anger or hate for hate. For that just means that hate and anger wins, both their hate and their anger and our hate and our anger. As Martin Luther King once said so famously, darkness cannot be driven away by darkness. Only light can do that. And so you do not hate the oppressor, but you love the oppressed. You do not hate the tyrant, but you love the persecuted. You do not hate the abuser, but you love the abused. Which is why we return to our story. Domitian was murdered, assassinated by his court. Trajan took over for him and in turn was also assassinated. And then Hadrian came, the worst of the bunch. He took all of the reforms that Domitian started and then outlawed anything that wasn't specifically Roman. He murdered and tortured thousands, including Rabbi Akiva. It is said that when Rabbi Akiva was brought before the Roman court and he was tried and convicted for teaching Torah, his flesh was combed away from his bones while he was still alive. He was asked in his torments if he felt his sufferings were good for him, if they were justified. He said the sufferings were sufferings of love. Not because torture is good, or that righteousness can handle punishment, or that he needs to be a symbol to other people, but because the Romans could not break his spirit. Even in the pain at the end of his life, he still looked upon the world and saw love, because as Song of Songs says, love is as fierce as death. In this in his very last moments, he sang out the words of the Shema and the Ahavta. His students, weeping, asked him why he was so joyous, and he answered calmly, My students, I now know what it means to love the Lord with all my heart, with all my might, and with all my soul, even until the moment of death. Love against the blackness is resistance. Love transforms. Love redeems. Love takes enemies and turns them into friends. Takes friends and turns them into lovers. We do not have to martyr ourselves like Rabbi Akiva, but our lives depend on the choices we make in this very moment. You cannot love God if you do not love justice. You cannot love God without loving the world. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor. This is Jewish love, commanded love, covenantal love. This is what the Gospels miss, and this is what we often miss ourselves. But the greatest principle of the Torah are our three words, the Ahavta, the Recha, Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. We have many real problems. We have environmental problems, political problems, racial, economic problems, but we must build a world on love. For out of the darkness, like God, we, like Rabbi Akiva, must say, let there be love. Shana Tova Umetuka to each and every one of you. Let us rise together as we bless this day with the words of Kiddush on page 56. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Give 
us another year of life together, who sustains us and keeps us and brings us to this beautiful place. May we have another year of life together in blessing and prosperity and peace. And together we say, Amen. And continue with Alenu, page 58. <laughs> Page 64 is the mourner's Kaddish. Anyone who is in mourning, observing a yard side, would just like to say the words, please join me on page 64. And in our community, it's been a tradition since I've gotten here, so about 10 years now, that if anyone is mourning alone, they should feel the warmth of another by them. So if you see anyone standing by themselves, please stand with them, <coughs> recite mourner's Kaddish on page 64. Yitkadal <laughs> v'yitkadash shemei rabah. Veoma divra hirote veomich mahute. Vechayehon veomehon. 
Chaye de Chol Beit Yisrael, Bagala Ulisman Kari, Yimru Amen. Yes, Shme Rabba Mubarak, Leolam Ome Amen. Yit Barak, Vishtabak, Yit Bahar, Vishraman Vidnase. Yit Adar, Yit Alev, Yit Alal, Shme de Kucham, Rehuhu. Le Ela, Le Ela, Minko, Birchata, Vishirata, Tushtehata, Benechamata. Dami Rambi Amad Imru Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya Vechayim Aleinu Ve'alko Yisrael Imru Amen. Ose Shalom Vimrama Uya Ose Shalom Aleinu Ve'alko Yisrael May one who finds peace and comfort and love in the heavens above help us find peace, comfort, and love amongst all of our brothers and sisters down below and together we say Shana Tova to everyone. Nice to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and call on David Spiegel, who is our president, for a few announcements. Shana Tova. Okay. So I want to thank Rabbi Farkas, Cantor Fox, musical director Chris Harden, the BBS choir, our FEMA officer, and Elaine Gill, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. All of you came in with tickets today. Remember, the rest of the high holiday, you need those tickets. If you, if you forget your ticket, you can go get a replacement at the security desk north of the, secu of the security gate. In terms of transportation, and parking, this year we really ask that you consider using Uber, Lyft, and GoGo Grandparent to get to the synagogue tomorrow and for Yom Kippur. We have sent out discount codes for use. This is especially important this year as we have fewer spaces available for parking in the near neighboring buildings. The rideshare services are very convenient ways to come to services as you will be dropped off on Densmore right in front of VBS. Street parking is available with most parking restrictions lifted on our neighboring streets. Of course, if you still need overflow parking, our parking attendants can direct you to spaces in three nearby offices, but we have fewer spaces than we have in the past. If you park in the office buildings, take a parking ticket and have it stamped at the usher's table in the main hallway. Again, this year we are providing valet parking for members with valid disabled placards. The drop-off point is right near our security booth and pickup is located at the corner of Moore Park in Densmore. Please keep in mind there may be a long wait for the valet to bring your car around at peak times. There, we've added plenty of seating this year you know, for that, uh, for while you're waiting for the pickup. There are two family services tomorrow morning. Our service for families of preschool children begins at 9.15, and our service for families of elementary age children at 10.30. Both are in Cher Lapati. We're also offering an afternoon family service at 4 p.m. in Malkin Burdor. Ticket holders for this service and holders of tickets to any other high holiday service at BBS are welcome to attend. Main Sanctuary services tomorrow begin with preliminary prayers at 7.45 a.m. in this here. This service is for both Sanctuary and Malkin Burdor ticket holders. At 9 o'clock, Reserve seating takes over in the sanctuary and the Malkin Burdor services begin. Please remember to participate in our annual project push cart to help those in need. We are collecting food for SOVA and new socks, t-shirts, and underwear for veterans. Collection stations are near the parking lot. Our information tables also have materials to register for organ donations this year. Please take those materials home and literally save a life by registering. On behalf of the officers, board of directors, and staff, Shana Tova.
David's right about Uber and Lyft. I mean, if you take Uber or Lyft here, it's almost free if you live in the Valley with our discount code. You'll arrive and you'll come into shul and you won't feel stressed. You won't be upset that someone took your spot or they had to walk down Densmore or walk down Moore Park. I think you could probably save like 20 minutes of time by taking Uber or Lyft. And the question is, what do you want to do with those 20 minutes? You could repent for your sins. You could learn the Torah. You can give early and often to the annual campaign. Plenty of things you can do for, say, those 20 minutes. But seriously, if you take Uber or Lyft, and if you don't have a smartphone, or you don't know how to use a smartphone, or you know someone who doesn't have a smartphone, or she or he doesn't know how to use a smartphone, you can call GoGo Grandparent, and they'll use your Uber or your Lyft code to uh, order Uber or Lyft for said person who doesn't have a smartphone. So hey, please go ahead and use them. Um, we're going to go ahead and finish our service now. Andrew Fox, come on up. This is our 11th year together. Can you believe that? I'm sorry, I didn't 11 hear that. Year, yeah, 11 years together. Are you serious? Yeah. You've been here 11 years? Yeah. Seems much longer. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Tell me about it. Four kids, a mortgage. It's, uh, 15 pounds. I think a little more than that, too. Uh, <laughs> gray hair. I love you. Oh, I love you, too. <laughs> Let's sing together. Let's sing together. Sorry, 